Jan Jacobson has trained and taught dressage for over 30 years and has been an AHSA dressage judge for almost 20 years. Her work with instructors like Carl Mikolka, Bengt Lungfist, Michael and Tom Poulin, and Ernst Bockinger has helped her to achieve classically correct basics and understand the way saddle fit affects horse's movement and rider's position. Jan's formal introduction to saddle fitting came through England's Paul Belton, who was the president of Albion Saddle Makers and an executive member of the Society of Master Saddlers. Jan continues to ride and train in Ithaca, New York. Her recent accomplishments include numerous saddle fitting clinics nationwide, judging dressage shows throughout the country, and a student qualified for the FEI North American Young Rider Championships. Hi, my name is Jan Jacobson, and I'm here to talk about saddle fit. Why has saddle fit suddenly become such an important issue? Well, it's always been extremely important. In fact, for a military or working horse, it was crucial for the relationship between their horse and themselves. And if a saddle fit problem did exist, it would show up almost immediately. In the past, the local saddler was responsible for making sure that the saddles fit. In fact, a saddle was made for a particular horse and was frequently sold with the horse. As the horse would continue to change and grow and develop, the saddler would make the necessary adjustments for that saddle and the horse would be able to be comfortable and happy with what he was getting. Now there are specialized saddles for almost every event and every discipline. Sometimes in eventing, one rider will ride as many as three saddles on one horse. In many cases, these saddles are purchased through a catalog with little regard for whether it fits the horse or the rider. In some situations, there are many horses using a single saddle that makes it very difficult for the horse or the rider. And in some situations, the rider actually picks a saddle without any regard for whether it fits the horse. In England, almost every shop has a working saddler to take care of the horses in their area. In fact, in England, if you do need a good working saddler, you call the Society of Master Saddlers and they give you a list. Unfortunately, in the US, we don't have such a list and it's very hard to find a good working saddler. A talented horse and rider could never achieve their full potential unless the saddle really is fitted correctly. Bucking, rearing, and many other signs of resistances are frequently attributed to saddle fit. So, the more you know about saddle fit, the better you have a chance of achieving that harmony that you need and you want between yourself and your horse. Let's take a look at the very basics of good saddle fit. Placement, tree size, balance, stability, and the width of the gullet are all crucial to the comfort of the horse. In order to have a good fit, all five of these requirements need to be met. To determine whether a particular saddle fits a horse, you first need to look at the placement. The saddle should be placed behind the scapula or shoulder blades. This is necessary to give the horse the freedom of movement he needs to perform correctly. If the saddle is placed too far forward, the pressure on the shoulder blades is constrictive and painful. Also, the balance is usually affected and can cause pressure under the cantle or the rear of the saddle. Second, the tree size must be neither too narrow or too wide. In both cases, pressure points and soreness will develop. Ideally, there should be approximately two to three fingers clearance under the pommel. Next, the balance of the saddle must be correct in order to distribute the rider's weight throughout the entire panel. The deepest or lowest point should be in the center of the saddle, not toward the front or the rear. If the saddle is sitting cantle low, all of the weight of the rider would be supported by the rear half of the panel. This can cause the horse to be very sore under the cantle. Fourth is stability. The saddle must not rock like a rocking chair. The rider usually doesn't feel this problem, but the horse does. To check for this problem, push alternately on the front and then on the rear. Just the opposite occurs when the saddle bridges. If your fingers can slip under the panel in the middle of the saddle, then it bridges. Finally, the width of the gullet is extremely important. If the gullet is too narrow, 
The pressure would then be on or very close to the spine, which could be very painful. The final decision must be made by the horse. It's necessary to tune in to the horse's body language so we can understand good saddle fit. You'd be amazed at how many people do not know where the shoulder blade is, where the scapula is. They don't know. To find the scapula, you put your hand on the shoulder blade part and you run your fingers until your fingers fall off, essentially. Curl around or fall off that point. And it does that. There's a few breeds, Arabs, if they're very, very, very fit, is, are very difficult. OK, here is a graphic arts tool that I doubt is sold very much anymore for graphic arts because computers do what this tool used to do. This is, used to be a graphic arts tool for things like ship's curves and doing charts and graphs, and, and they're sold for us now. I mean, we buy them by the box load. So it's a very good tool to do what we need. It's like a Gumby toy. Put, it's, wherever you put it, it stays. Um, it does have some degree of, if you mishandle it, it's going to lose it. So you do have to be careful with it when you handle it, uh, careful only in that you lose your reading. OK, you've got basically, and what will be shown, are three tracings along the spine, along the back, and one tracing down the spine. What I like to do is to have the first tracing two fingers behind the point of the shoulder. OK, so there's our first tracing. Just about two fingers behind the point of the shoulder blade. And I like to go both sides. With him being square, which we're going to square him up because I'm seeing some asymmetry. Good boy. OK, now it's laying the way it should on both sides. And it stays. And I want to make sure that I know that my right side is still the right side. This part's important. That gets laid down. and traced on the inside edge. That's the first one. So the first tracing we've taken right here. OK, the next one, the lowest point of the back. Same routine. And again, being careful that your right side is your right side, because you'll pick up a lot of uh, asymmetrical horses through this method. OK. Then the last tracing is taken. Let me mark that. This tracing is taken right there. Then the last tracing is taken at the back of the saddle, just under the cantle. So if we were to put a saddle on the horse, the back of the cantle is what we're after. Do you remember in the uh, one place where we're saying the distance from the first point to the lowest point of the back changes by breed? And it's very true. So we start at the same point as the first tracing. And what's important is to go to the back tracing. That's the part I want right in there. Now, this is the tricky part. I also want to know how low is this compared to that point. This is the one thing no method measuring saddles to date gives you. 
This is what will affect the balance. You remember all the time we were talking about balance of the horse? That's what needs to be told. If I were to lay this thing perfectly level from this point, I would end up with about three of my fingers are about two and a half inches. Does that make sense? If I had a carpenter's level, that's what we would come up with. That piece is very important. And that's, I want to lay it on the paper so that it shows. So we're talking to have this level, we need about that much. Do you understand? Make sense? I'm now picking it up and we go and we position it on the paper the same way. This gives me this. This shows the withers, the lowest point of the back, and the behind, under the cantle. And it also shows me if I'm using this and this as my point of equality or grid paper, I know that from this point to this point is about, there's my three fingers. Now I know what this horse will need as far as a balance. This particular horse happens to be pretty typical. He doesn't need something very big and he doesn't need something small. He's normal. Same thing here. This has to go in the same spot that we took. And you can see by the, that this is going to end up in about the same place. So what we then do is start positioning. Okay. The center one is supposed to be at zero to start, which I think is helping. And this one has to come down a little. Still a little too much. Now we're getting there. Then I want to go around on the other side and check for the same. Okay, I have contact through all these wings. It's set right in the middle. There's contact at each major point. Okay, check on the other side, see if I have the same issue. Okay, when I'm done, this basically can be picked up, the readings taken, filled out on a form, and can be sent to a saddler who then puts the readings in this position, and you have the saddle. You know what the horse needs. You know this line, what you don't know, the only thing is balance issue again. This is wonderful. The only hole in it, as I see, is again not being able to understand balance. Now, we're looking at this, the front isn't too bad. However, there's a huge, huge gap right here. I mean, my fingers are all the way under it. This isn't bad, and this isn't too bad. There's not a, ho a lot of contact here. There's only about this much in the middle for contact. So there's only a small amount of weight bearing surface. It's not too much weight bearing surface and it's a little bit shallow here. So on this horse at this time, what we would end up getting is the front is adequate. The middle isn't going to work. And we can see that on the horse. Okay? That's how this is used. You saddlers go out and you fit a horse. Or you owners, you have a horse. Mitchell's an example. He bought a horse, the horse was one size. I saw the horse three weeks later and he'd already gained quite a bit of weight and he gained almost, I would suspect, almost a full tree size. So what's important for you, for owners as well as for saddlers, is to have this with a date, with a weight tape measurement. 
weight tape measurement with this and the date gives you, as riders, some degree of understanding to monitor the process as it happens. Your horse is changing, he's growing, he's developing. Is his weight changing? Oh, his weight's not changing, but he's muscled. Oh, that's interesting. He's now changed through here, or he's gained a ton of weight. No wonder the saddle doesn't fit. That's why it's important to monitor. Okay. At this point, all I like to do is to take almost any saddle and just describe basics. So let's just talk about what we learned earlier. Where are the parameters and what are you looking for? First is placement. So we're going to go back. Remember the point of the tree? We're going to look for placement. We're looking for the point of the tree, which is here. Because below that point, it doesn't matter. So here's our shoulder blade. Here's our two fingers. There's our placement. OK? The next thing is tree. Pressing down firm, I have what I call two or three mushed fingers. I can get two open. I can't get three full. So this tree will end up being too low in time because it's a new saddle. It'll come down. So it's going to come down almost a finger, and that puts it too close. If it were the right tree size, the next thing we would look at is balance. How's the balance? Not too bad. It's not too bad. I think I'd like a tiny, tiny bit firmer behind, perhaps. But a lot of that has to do with, again, what the horse does when he's moving. So I think I could live with if this were very firmly flocked or to have to go to a narrow tree, a narrower. Not a narrow, but a narrower. Firmly back here so that the saddle is balanced. If we raise the front, the back has to come up also. Logical? So if I'm going to make this one finger higher, then I'm going to need this also a little bit up. Why am I doing this bare-bodied? Because that's the best way to get a reading on any saddle, be it Western or English. OK, the best way. Now, we've talked about balance. The last thing is stability. How do I know this doesn't bridge or rock? Rock, you test. Push here, push here. Do you remember the, the slide where you pushed and the saddle went way up in the air? And you pushed here and it went way up? OK. We're finding out that this definitely doesn't rock. It has only. The, the amount of give in it that the horse actually shows. But does it bridge? To check bridge, you put your hand underneath the saddle and run your hands all along the panel area, particularly in the middle. If your fingers slide way under in the middle, there's a good chance it's bridging. As you come back, is there much more pressure right here than there is under here? On this horse, a little tiny bit more, yeah. So this horse has a tiny bit bridging in the saddle. Is it changeable by wool? Yes. It's only a little bit. It's very, very, very easy. The next issue is, OK, if we get a saddle that's very comfortable, is he going to come up in his back? He may. When you pick his belly up, the next thing he does is lifts right up in here. When I do that, it no longer bridges. But right now, that's not what he's doing. He's not a dressage horse. He's a hunter. So his back will probably pretty much maintain about the same. OK? Channel for the gullet. We saw that we wanted a gullet that's wide enough not to bother the spine. The spinal area, the spine itself, is this wide, right there. The spinal processes on each side are even wider. Pressure on the spine causes pain. If the rider sits crooked, then you already have a problem. So far, we've got all the parameters, but the tree is fractionally too wide. So we've got an almost. It's possible if this saddle were the one that the rider liked, could we flock it to fit? Yes, provided he didn't get any narrower. Does that make sense? If he got narrower, we'd be in trouble. OK? All right, let's look at another one or two on just to kind of get an overview.
again, placement, point. There's my two fingers. The point is, in fact, behind that, OK? If you'll let me do it without wiggling. OK, there's our placement. How about the top? For a jumping saddle or for a higher withered horse, this is important. The higher the withers or a jumping saddle, I like a hair more. It's important to have a little more. The higher withered horse means it's going to settle more. It's just going to slide right down. A wider horse, you can get by with a little closer, safer, without damage, with no anticipation of damage. If you've got a high withered horse, you've got to give yourself a little more clearance. If the saddle is up here, which is where it's placed so often, it is. Uh, how many hunters do you see go this? Several things happen. One, when they sit, which isn't a lot, when they do sit, everything is down. They're going to be sitting all the way back here. All of the weight will be now here. It now bridges, like I can put my whole hand underneath the middle, and it now digs him with a pressure point here. This saddle, maybe I have one with no gusset, and it wouldn't dig him, but I'd still have some bridging unless it were a curvy tree, which is where some of the curvy trees came in. OK, so if it's here, you can tell where the balance is now. I mean, we're talking all the way back here. Now, the rider says to me, I hate it if you move the saddle back, because I'm too far away from my horse. But watch what happens. OK, that's, I should mark it on lower because it'll cover the flap up. That's where the rider is sitting now. The other thing is if the saddle is so down and back, it's much harder for them to get out of the saddle and let the horse close the angle. Now remember what I said about where you were. Remember, there's the mark of where the lowest part was. That's where the rider was sitting. Where's the rider sitting? As soon as I balance this a fraction, which is what we talked about, the rider is in the same place. Again, moving the saddle back means that you, the rider, stay in the same place and better balanced. Okay, as you can see, this area right in here is dry. And he's quite wet all the way through here. So let's see by looking at it, is it possible that it's being contributed to? OK, so we're looking at basic saddle fit. First thing we're going to do, placement. I would think it's probably fractionally too far forward by the sweat mark, but let's see. That's about where this saddle wants to be no matter what. OK? So I, I feel it's a little too far forward. How much clearance? Clearance is just about right. Maybe it's about two fingers, and it's a well-broken in saddle. So we can live with that. And she's not heavy, so that's an OK thing. The next issue, balance, looks reasonably good. But we all know what I'm looking at. OK, that's a rocker panel. There's not enough weight bearing back here to support her. So when she's sitting in the saddle, it comes back here. When she's rising up, it comes forward. OK? That's what we don't want. Now, does the dry spot mean there's more pressure? Looking at the under part of the saddle, it's possible. Because the whole dry spot is from here to here and realize that that's probably where the saddle is carrying all the rider's weight, not in the back. So the, horse saddle, the horse is able to sweat much more profusely in the back. The only time the horse is carrying weight in the back is when she's sitting down and then rocking back forward. OK? So that's the kind of thing. It's wonderful to look at sweat patterns because they do tell stories. That's why it's wonderful to have this example. It's, it's fantastic. Does that make sense? But by their sweat mark, I think it was placed right there. 
but by the also rocking, so this is an issue we will have a whole chapter on, a whole section on. Any satellite rock is inclined to move forward. When you put it, does it like tend to go forward? Then show me where you want to put it. Now realize Lisa hasn't been in on the saddle fitting seminar, so she doesn't know, guys, what we know. So this is a, a nasty trick question. I'm the ignorant person. But this is what we have. We have people who don't know, who want to do the right thing, but need the answers. OK. What do you think, judge and jury? Too far forward. Because what we want is there's no freedom here. The edge of the scapula is this far underneath the saddle which is when I looked at the sweat pattern, it was pretty clear that's where she put it. So if you move it back, what will that do to the rest? Increase the rock. <laughs> you move it forward, there's a little. I move it back, and I've got more. Why do you think, even if, I, if she put it back here now, it wouldn't stay there. It would go forward. That's where it needs to be, but it's not going to stay there. She could get on the horse right now, tack it up, put it right there, and by the time she was three laps around the ring, it would be up the horse's neck. After you get it here, slide it back, that's the first niche. The second niche is there, and it'll settle right into a, what I call a second pocket. Okay? Now, if this saddle were girthed up, and here, put your, come around, put one hand here and the other hand under, right, right in here. Mm -hmm. Slide your fingers under the saddle mm -hmm. and press down. Mm -hmm. What do you feel? OK? She feels the shoulder blade go way in under the saddle. And that's why it's important. Now if we put it back here, which is where the saddle lives, mm -hmm. do the same thing. Press down, firm. Mm -hmm. It just touches the front. Make sense? That makes sense? Mm -hmm. Great. We, we, we love you for being our <laughs> guinea pig. We do. We appreciate it. So the first thing he's going to look for is placement. Next thing he's going to look for by pressing down on the top, how many fingers can be? Which brings me to an interesting point. How many of whose fingers? <laughs> the riders. He's exactly right. His fingers, my fingers, or someone that's five foot one and has little small hands? The riders. And if you don't have the rider there, then you've got to say, OK, this is a you know, five foot two person. She weighs 110 pounds, and she's got a little bitty hands. So she's not going to need three of his fingers. She's going to need three of hers. So that's two of his. OK? I get probably one and a half, maybe. So, so he's getting one and a half. OK? How many do I get? Not enough. OK? So too wide. Too wide. So we've got the placement. He's decided what on how much clearance. I have just about this. I have pressing down. I have my three fingers. You have more than enough for three. Yeah, it, it might be a little bit. OK. That's what this kind of throws me. Hmm? As far as looking at the stability, mm -hmm. exactly. I mean, it doesn't look like it's OK. You need to. Think of the movement wise. Right. It's important to look for that. And so if it's if it's slightly rocking, which it is, it won't be bridging. Um, I don't know if you happen to notice the change in his body language. Did anybody notice that when he pressed down the horse did what? Yeah, he did. What does that tell you? Hmm. It tells you there's something in this saddle and this horse that's not quite right. Now, what if any one of these saddles were foam? There's some awfully, there's one or two very nice foam saddles that are beautiful, wide gullets, wide panels, but they're foam. If it happens to fit or was made for the horse, they're brilliant. 
a key word, if it happens to fit or was made correctly for the horse. Foam panels can be great. They're without lumps. They have no problems whatsoever. The problem occurs is what happens when the horse changes? Full stop. Horses don't stay the same. What happens when the horse moves? Was this foam panel saddle built for the horse when he's moving? or standing still. Okay. The best way to see a horse fitted, I like to do two things. I like to have the person come out completely as they ride, if you're going to analyze it. That means all pads, all everything. That way you have a better chance of understanding what they plan to do. Are they going to use a high density gel pad? I mean high density foam pad. Are they going to use a gel pad? Are they using a lift pad? Let's see what they're using and let's see where they put it. And I've had people come with a tree that's too narrow on the horse with three heavy pads because they feel it's better on the horse. Is this logical? If shoes are too snug for you, are you going to add three extra heavy pairs of socks? It's the same with a horse. If the tree is already too narrow for the horse, the horse is here, the, the saddle is narrow, so it's already too tight. You've already got three plus maybe four fingers or more. You have a major problem if you add extra pads. It doesn't work. It makes it worse and worse and worse. The horse is a seven-year-old Arabian that he just bought. He uses the horse predominantly for trail riding. They do a little bit, they're learning, both of them. He and his wife are working a little bit of dressage because they like the idea and the way the horses start to develop. And what you'll find is inevitably when you first do this, you will put the saddle still, and I still do, in the wrong place, until I actually put my fingers on the shoulder blade and say, oh, I still got to go back. So habit dies hard. It takes us a very, very long time to learn. Okay, all right, he's saying it fits, the balance seems to be good. He's got three mushed fingers in here. When the placement's there, it's not bridging, it's not rocking. It's definitely not there. There's no pressure points back here. There's a lot of people who would look at this, say, well, the balance is pretty good. So it, it's, it feels good to me. Look at the rest of the parameters. It doesn't rock. But what's going to happen here? Anybody want to come up and feel the pressure that this narrower tree at the base of the points is going to be right? Nothing, no contact there on the panel. Right down to there is the only pressure point. That's ca horse is carrying all your weight on this much of the panel. Does this make sense when it's a very narrow tree? All right, if that saddle were this, belonged to this horse, this horse would be sore here, which he's not. The other saddle that had the, so much rock to it on that one horse, the horse would be sore here. Does that make sense? The saddle that we just had on would also perhaps be a little sore back here, but the reason the saddle looked in balance is because the tree's so high and the horse is what? A little croup high. So the, the rider feels fine. The rider feels great on that saddle. And the horse is miserable. If I'm pressing quite firm all through this tissue and nothing is happening, okay? Nothing, no soreness. So had we had either one of those saddles that we've seen, what would we have? We would have sorenesses somewhere, okay? Let's put her saddle. Okay, is that her saddle? Good. Okay. Again, here's the shoulder blade. In order, I check myself, I must check myself over and over again. If I don't, I will still put it too far forward. 
I, it's too many years of doing it the wrong way. There's the shoulder blade. That's the placement. We've got three mushed fingers in here. I've got just about that, okay? We have no bridging, we have no rocking, and we have the center of the saddle there. Now, the horse is a little butt high, but what you don't know is that the back of the saddle is very, very soft. It's one of the softest flocked. You can press down, and I can compress it by this much, just squeezing on it. So it's a very soft, flocked saddle. So the whole thing just kind of settles into the horse's back. So let's see what this does. Now keep realizing that this saddle started off reasonable fit. So now I'm going to fix the saddle. Did it do it any real harm? Well, well, it raised the front. We'd expected that because it doesn't. It compresses to still close to half an inch. Um, it's slightly thicker in the back, so because it raised the front, it also raised the back. So we didn't lose our that little bit. So we're pretty much about the same balance. So if I had, again, a saddle that's too wide for the horse, I could get by with this. Now, having said that, I own two horses, and one of them's narrower than the other one, so how do I fix that problem? I fit the wider horse, and I do pad the narrower one. Why don't I do it the other way around? Because if I do, I will hurt my second horse, my wider horse. If I fit my narrower horse, with a medium wide tree, that's what he were, and I'm putting a medium wide tree on a wide horse, I'm gonna hurt him. I'm not gonna hurt it if I go in reverse. It's not ideal, but I'm not gonna do damage. That's the key. What about somebody that says, look, I have 15 horses in my stable and there's no way in the world I'm gonna have a separate saddle for every single horse. Okay. Bareback pads. Well, that's a good answer. Yeah. <laughs> well, the other answer I say is fine. If you're a serious trainer and you have 15 horses, then it's obvious that you want to do best by all the horses that are in training with you. Then I suggest that you get a variety of tree sizes. Three tree sizes usually covers full needs, at least two. That way, you've got a narrower horse, you put the narrow saddle on. You've got a little bit wider horse, you put that one on. You've got the wider horse, you put that one on. If you've got a super narrow horse, you put the narrowest tree and pat it. Got it? So if you've got 15 horses, then you buy an array of sizes. Then, only thing you have to worry about is what do you do behind? Do you have to put in a wedge pad, super thin in front? Maybe because the horse is a little low in the back. Maybe the horse is like the mare that's a little high here. Okay, so you got the right tree, but she's a little downhill. You got to build up the front fractionally because that's the only saddle that's fitting. You hear what I'm talking about padding. Every horse is a different situation. If you are going to use a one saddle for a bunch of horses, then you have to understand the rules by which you must play. If you have an adjustable tree, this were an adjustable tree. This is not an easy concept to follow, but unfortunately this is the case. You have a very narrow range of horses that an adjustable tree can fit correctly. The middle range. Either on either scale, it doesn't work for the reason we just did. Mm -hmm. As soon as you narrow up the tree, on some horses it's going to bridge. You widen out the tree, it's going to rock. The panel doesn't change, only the front changes, which means if you widen it out, now it drops down in front and you've got a rocker panel. But the horse needs the wider tree because he's sore if you don't. So what do you do? Then, so we take out the middle, we fix the saddle because he's got a wider horse. We literally put wool in the back, a little bit of wool in the front, flattened out the middle. Oh, big relief. Then he narrowed the tree up for the other horse. We go, whoa, 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 you can't do that. Because as soon as you do that, what's it gonna do? Bridge. There are a lot of times pads are very, very, very beneficial and necessary. But understand why you're using what pad, how it affects the horse, how it affects the balance, how does it affect the stability. 
once you understand those parameters, then you're in a position to make judgments as to what pads go with what horse and what saddle. Someone comes to you and says, I need a saddle. <laughs> this horse is nothing like the horse he's going to be at six years old. I mean, almost not recognizable. So what do you do? What do you do? It's almost impossible. The only thing you can do is to try to fit where the horse is now if you must. If they can't beg, borrow something that's at least close and comfortable. If they can't, then you don't have a choice but to go ahead and attempt to fit what you see and make sure that they know that the horse will change guaranteed. How much he changes, it's up to the breed. Thoroughbreds literally tend to go out. When you get a young thoroughbred, they're like this. As they mature and develop in their muscles, they go out more. I've seen some Dutch warm bloods when they were four, they looked wider than the Arab mare, like this. They went down to a medium wide. So they started off when they were four years old as an extra wide, went back to a medium wide. They changed two tree sizes the other way. Thoroughbreds, some quarter horses start off narrower and they go wider. So how do you predict? You can't. You can't. He will change. If you change training as it progresses, they change. Horses that start off at training level, by the time they get to first, second, and third level, most of them bulk out, except for Dutch warm bloods and a few others. But most of them grow through the wither area. When they get to 10 to 12 years old and they start doing higher levels, if you get to the point where you're doing the higher levels, Grand Prix, they change again. They go back narrower because now, they're using this part of their back so much that these muscles are no longer being used the same way. So they change again. So they change constantly for a hundred reasons. They are not static. Count on their changing. If you depend on them to change, then you've got a good chance that you can keep up with them while they change. interesting thing with this horse is right now you see as a pretty normal looking back. It has a fairly normal amount of give to it. Nothing unusual. You wouldn't think there'd be too much of a fitting problem. He's a little rear high. So you just need the back a little bit down. Right? Anybody see anything else unusual about this horse at all? As a fitting problem? Noli's got a frown on her face. Okay. Remember, he's the one that had the lowest point of his back this close to the shoulder point. Interesting. Okay, having said that, that's a lot of times what happens when he works. Because where he changes is right in here. It's under there. There it is. Okay, this area changes, but from this point here, you end up with a line, this part right here lifts, and this lifts. Right now it looked normal. There it's flatter. If I were to take a level and put on at the top of the front line straight to the back, we're probably down to a drop of about an inch and a half at the most. Can you see that? Canter.
And this is not the only horse that does this. Some horses do it more or less than others. Make sense? And walk, walk. OK, now the other thing I want to do is to put a couple of saddles on, do a belly lift, simulate what we just saw, and see what happens. Because what you're going to see is that most saddles won't fit him. Let me have any one of the medium wide or wide trees. Me, uh, wide's probably better, because he's pretty wide. You're staying put. Grow roots. Now, standing still, we've got a nice fit. We've got three fingers, no bridging, nice feel all the way through. And I'd say spot on, wouldn't you say? There's not anything at all anywhere to object to in this saddle. But when he moves, that's what he does. Got it? This much play. Okay. Do you know how to do a belly lift? Yeah. Do a belly lift. No, with the saddle on. Yeah. Got it? There's no way. So how do you fit a horse like this? 90% of the people I know are going to fit this horse standing just like he is, standing still without a belly lift, right? In this horse's case, we couldn't ride him. I've tried. Worse than that, the saddle won't stay anywhere near where it is. If I put this saddle on and we rode him, within three laps around the ring, it would be up there. If I tried to canter, it would be up there. <laughs> so, and I get a lot of calls from people that say, I've tried this, 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 and this, and they won't stay in place. Why do they keep going forward? The major reason I keep finding, maybe there are other people who have solutions, but the major reason I find is what happens when they move, and most of the time, the saddle that is a beautiful, perfect fit when they're standing around turns into a brilliant rocker panel. Now, you're talking a lot of the warm bloods that do this. And yet, I was down in Kingston, saw an Arabian that had even more of this, that had more lift in the loin, more lift in the rib cage, and every saddle we put on her looked like a teeter totter. So it's not just warm bloods. You have to be alert for it for all breeds. Not so much thoroughbreds, just because they're already fairly high withered, but I do see it in most breeds, OK? Where does a horse show soreness when this happens? You have a saddle fit problem that's brilliant in the beginning. Where does he show soreness? Everywhere. He starts off with one set of problems. He started off with a saddle that fits, so it wasn't sore, OK? But it didn't stay there more than six feet. OK, so first, now the tree's wrong, so now it's a little too wide for where it's riding, and there's pressure on the shoulder points. Then the next thing it does is it's now keeps on creeping up, cantle low. Now you've got soreness in the back. So where's the horse? If it's severely rocker and you force it to stay in place, what's the solution for saddles that move forward? foregirth. So what does that do? The horse moves his back. It's forced to stay in place. Now follow this scenario through. You have a foregirth. The saddle is not allowed to move. Everybody near know what a foregirth is. A foregirth is going, it goes, it's a, it's a, usually a metal frame in front. It's built sort of like a fork of a tree. And it has sort of supports that wrap around the front edges of the saddle. And it goes right behind the shoulder blades and girthed up quite tight. 
That keeps the saddle from going forward. And it does work. Riders are much happier. So in many cases, the performance improves. So you think you have found the solution to your migrating saddle. The only problem is you have forced this saddle to stay in place on a horse that moves like that horse. What are you going to do? Now you've got pain smack in the middle, in the rocker area, because now you've got a teeter-totter. You force it to stay in place, you've got pain, and it'll concentrate in one area, and the next thing you know, he'll become more and more and more and more hollow. So is the solution a foregirth or a crupper? Same issue with a crupper. Doesn't constrict the shoulders, a crupper, but it's very annoying for most horses. Ponies have to have them because there's no way in the world a saddle stays put on a pony. Why? Because they're flat, 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 flat backs. Flat withers and very flat backs. So they're not going to stay in place. So there's the crouper. So what other solutions are there for a saddle that won't stay in place? Hmm. OK, makes sense? Flatten the middle, extra on the two ends, make the saddle bridge. This horse has to be cantled low by this much and bridging before the saddle fits him moving. So it has to not fit to fit. <laughs> She's five. And when we got her, she was very, 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 very skinny. So she's gained quite a bit of weight. But she's still pretty high withered. And she's also, this area right here is the part that gets got from here to here. And that's the problem area for thoroughbreds under saddle. Her shoulder blade literally is all the way up here. This means that you've got from here all the way to here, the saddle scooped down much sooner. So if you have clearance here, there's still a chance that the saddle is going to be touching her here. It's not uncommon to have thoroughbreds with a lot of white hairs here very common. I see it often. And it's not, back here it's saddle. Almost 90% of the time. If it's a little further up, it's usually, if it's up in here, it's usually blankets or something because again, blankets have a hard time fitting their high withers as well. Saddle pads will also cause white withers, by the way, guys. Saddle pads can cause major problems if the kind of saddle pad slides down and causes if you can't slide your fingers while you're riding, check it every once in a while. And if you can't, there's a good chance it's causing pressure. Now, remember what I said, some horses you can tell where their withers are, I mean, their shoulders are, and some horses you can't? This is one where you've got to feel it. You've got to say, huh, where did it go? It's in there somewhere. I mean, really, it's not so easy, because there's already a fair amount of strength in here. OK, right here's the edge of her scapula, and if you question it, when you pick it up, when you pick her leg up, you can feel it move. Thank you. Very nice. You can see that's a pretty narrow horse. So how do we fit a horse like this? Very carefully. OK. All right. That help? Yeah, sure. Points to remember when using the saddle tech gauge. Remember that placement is crucial for accurate readings. The wings must be vertical or perpendicular to the ground and full contact with the horse on each of the wings is necessary. 
Also note that it is not necessary for the spine of the gauge to be in contact with the horse at all points. Okay. This is probably the narrowest horse that I've done with the gauge, and it's 80 degrees. Most of the ones we've done that are medium trees are about 85 with our mediums. So that's a pretty narrow horse. One thing to bring up, which I have neglected to bring up, and I get this question fairly often, is, well, when I put the saddle back where you tell me to put it, then the girth goes all the way down the middle of their barrel and it doesn't stay. No, the girth goes where the girth goes, the saddle goes where the saddle goes. And in many cases, that means that the saddle will be back here and the girth will have to come forward. The girth goes in what I guess I call the girth pocket, one hand behind the point of the elbow. That's where the girth lives. No matter what happens with the saddle, the girth still lives in the same spot. And in some cases, that means it will be going forward to get to that point. We have basically three mushed, which for a wither like that is pretty good. We have no bridging. We have minuscule rock. A little bit of rock, but not like Jack. You can see the difference in the breeds. You saw her lift, and yet she lifts in a different way. Now remember this tree is the one that sat up on everything we put it on almost so far? It was too high and it rocked. I'm down to two open. Eh, I can't make three, so I'm down to two, what I call two and a half fingers, pressing hard. Perfectly stable, perfectly stable. That's very nice through there. Nice following all the way through. If the tree were fractionally narrower, I think I could live with this, other than one factor. The gullet. Now again, that's my opinion. Obviously, there's a lot of saddle manufacturers feel that this is not an issue. Personally, I feel it is an issue. So I have to go with what I believe. The bottom line is, once again, ask the horse. You now have a good grasp of the basics and static fit. In the next volume, we will take a good close look at horses and riders in action.